Saludamos a Chanel Miller, que se encuentra en su casa de Nueva York. Chanel, ¿qué tal? Bienvenida. Muchísimas gracias por atendernos. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here with you today. Chanel, tú has estado durante más de cuatro años ocultando tu identidad y ahora has querido reivindicar tu nombre. ¿Qué te ha llevado a dar este paso? For a long time, I was ashamed of who I was. I thought that I had done something wrong. I thought that I had failed in lots of ways. When I read my statement to the judge and he had given a light sentence, I thought that was because I had failed to communicate something and that it was just embarrassing that I had shared all of my feelings. But when the world discovered my statement and started sending me letters, they would tell me things like, you are courageous, I want my daughter to grow up to be like you. They would send me pictures of their daughters. And through reading the letters over the years, I started to reprogram how I saw myself. The world was teaching me to see myself properly. And over time, I became more proud of who I was. And as I was writing the book, I realized that I didn't have anything to be ashamed of. Lo cierto es que durante el juicio te sometieron a un escrutinio muy exhaustivo, tu vida personal, tu trabajo, se exhibieron incluso en la sala esas fotografías tuyas tras la agresión, en el hospital, que la vio toda la gente que estaba allí, tu propia familia, los periodistas. ¿Cómo te sentiste? I remember when I was testifying, any time I would speak, the defense attorney would interrupt me and try to shut down what I was saying. And when I was in court, it felt like the defense attorney had his hand on my head and was holding me under water. And I was kicking, always trying to come up for air, to communicate something, but it was really difficult to get my message across. And while I was there, it was humiliating. La defensa del agresor de Brock Turner lo presentó como si realmente él fuera una víctima, un deportista brillante, un buen estudiante con una carrera prometedora, pero que bueno, había cometido un error. Claro, si él era la víctima y tú la persona que sufriste la agresión, ¿quién representa que eres tú? ¿En qué lugar te coloca a ti? Well, I thought it was interesting. He definitely used his appearance to his advantage, saying, how can a white-skinned, blue-eyed person be a criminal. This person doesn't appear to be dangerous. And I think that's the problem is we see it as a mistake instead of a crime, instead of three felonies that have been committed. So what's interesting in trial was that they focused so much on his future, all of the things that he would become, maybe an Olympian swimmer, an academic, he was a proud son, whereas for the female, who is me, they focused on my past. How many times has she blacked out? What's her history with parting? So I was trapped in the past and he was being projected in this golden light of the future. Recordemos que finalmente el agresor fue condenado por tres delitos de agresión sexual e intento de violación. La pena máxima es de 14 años, pero él finalmente fue condenado a seis meses, de los cuales solo pasó tres en prisión. Chanel, ¿tú qué crees que influyó para que esa pena fuera tan leve? I noticed in court, it was almost like he was driving down a road and had driven off the road and everyone's job was to return him back to the road. Um, But they said, if we can preserve his life trajectory, that's what we're going to do. Whereas my life trajectory, I couldn't change what had happened to me. I have to live with it no matter what. And that was really difficult. And when I read my statement in court, I stood up, I faced my assailant, his attorney, the judge. I spoke about everything that had hurt me. And so when the judge said six months, I immediately thought, why did I read that? Why did I read my diary to these men? It's so ridiculous. And I went home thinking that I had no power. 
La violencia contra la mujer es una de las grandes lacras que arrastramos sin duda como sociedad. Las violaciones, agresiones sexuales se suceden cada día por todo el mundo, pero casos como el tuyo, casos como el de la manada aquí en España, que sé que conoces perfectamente, ayudan a tomar conciencia. ¿Qué les dirías a todas esas mujeres que han vivido episodios similares al tuyo? I think first we need to stop normalizing that assault will always happen because it doesn't need to happen um, and should not put the burden only on the women to protect themselves. When someone is assaulted, we tend to investigate her and regard it as a personal failure. When I see it, bigger picture as a societal failure. We, as a society, have failed to protect our young women. Lastly, I want to say that that night, even though it was a horrible night where you have an assault happening, you also had the two men who saved me. And when they stopped my attacker, they yelled at him, apologize to her. What were you doing? Apologize to her. And so we have models of what kind of man you can be. And so I ask yourself at the end of the day, who do you want to be? Because a safer world is possible, violence is not acceptable, and it's not natural, and every woman is entitled to just having an ordinary life. That's all we want to do, is to be able to walk down the street in the evening, to go to a party, to go to school, and not have to think about keeping ourselves safe all the time. That's all that we're asking at the end of the day, and it's completely what we deserve. Sin duda, nos queda muchísimo trabajo, pero seguiremos eh, peleando para, para conseguirlo. Chanel Miller, muchísimas gracias por tu valentía, por tu ejemplo y por contarnos tu historia. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be with you today. So thanks for giving me your platform and time. Gracias. Y